Well, good morning, fam. It is another Freedom Friday, and you are still not free, but hopefully you will be freer after an hour for this conversation. Uh, I just want to show you right now, you just see me on the screen. That's because my uh, ace bill cool yoon, my uh, my brother in uh, uh, in waiting is not with me today, Sharif El Mekki. He will be here. But uh, like many people uh, in the world, he's got back to back things going on. So he's going to be about 10 minutes late, but he will be joining us still. So don't worry, you're not just fly flying solo with Chris. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, for us, by us in education, the reconstructing education for us, by us specifically. Uh, part of the thing that we always talk about on Fridays is the history. Uh, that should inform us when we think about the way that we should educate our kids today. What comes before us? What did our ancestors know? What is the uh, black educational capital that we have been neglecting over time for years? And uh, Freedom Friday is a way for us to say, if we really want to be free, we will go back and reclaim and recapitalize some of that black educational capital I think a lot of it was lost in 1954 after Brown v. Board, but we certainly lost it in many times since then, many parts of our history since then. Uh, just as a frame to start with, I have to always like go back and say, you know, let's remind ourselves that education is a uniquely African-American pursuit in America. African-Americans gave you public education across the South, um, not just for black folks, but for white folks too. In the reconstruction era, there's no way to look at the genesis of what we call public education for all, free universal public education for all, and not see that much of it came at the pen in the hands of black elected officials during reconstruction for that short period of time where uh, blacks were put uh, into a position where they could control some of uh, the, the major governing systems in the South. And also the drive of African-Americans to become literate, to learn to uh, read, be numerate, become educated, starting from uh, the periods when we were enslaved and then shortly after emancipation, and then all through reconstruction, and then all through the civil rights movement, all the way until today, uh, African-Americans pursuit, the African-American pursuit of education has been consistent and strong and driving. And it's a shame that we come to a point today where we are tagged and labeled with the stereotype that we just don't value education. It is one of the most nasty and devilish things that has been done to us to slander and libel us as people who don't care about education. So when I make points like this, I'm by myself, but I'm never standing by myself. I bring in big guns when I uh, talk about these issues. And that way y'all can't discount a brother. So I am bringing in the biggest of my big guns. One of the most esteemed people I know in the universe, uh, in my particular universe, because she speaks to us, like we're people, real people, none of that nonsensical education BS where people have jargon laden kind of rap songs that they sing from place to place, but they got zero receipts. This is the opposite, uh, opposite of that. This is Kaya Henderson, CEO and founder of Reconstruction US, which is a multifunctional uh, multimedia learning platform that is unapologetically black, that covers the things that your teachers might be leaving out and gives you a, a, a competent, um, strong platform to learn on that isn't uh, um, just all bells and whistles and, and flavor of the month. It's actual real learning. It's real pedagogical uh, um, prowess in, in, in one place. Um, Kaya also is the co-host of Pod Save uh, the People, which is a podcast that is award-winning uh, and a uh, national uh, podcast with a large uh, following. She's also uh, uh, a leader with Teach for All and a distinguished scholar in residence at Georgetown University. Kaya, good morning. Thank you for joining. Good morning. It's good to be here. You are such a bright light. You're such an amazing person. You are the echo of our ancestors, like, like just beaming. Like if they were sending us a message, it's you. You the message. Oh my gosh. That is yes. um, yeah. that is super nice. And um, you know, you bring it out in me. What could I tell you? Well, I want to hear about, 
um, about this work that I know that you're excited about that you're doing now? Like, where, so, so for people listening and watching, what should they know about Reconstruction US and, um, and what are you hoping to accomplish with it? Uh, for, for us in general, what are you hoping to accomplish with it? So Reconstruction US is an educational platform uh, where young people and now grownups as well can have access to an unapologetically black education. Um, the idea, which you were part of helping to form, the idea was, you know, we watch Jewish people send their kids to Hebrew school and Korean people send their kids to Korean school. Those other communities are intentional about the racial and cultural identity development of their kids. They don't wait for other government schools to teach their kids their history or to tell their kids who they are. Who they are. And we come from a long tradition of that. And we wanted to rekindle that tradition at scale, drawing on citizenship schools, drawing on freedom schools, we've always been responsible responsible for, or in our Sunday schools or in our Jack and Jill groups or wherever, all across our cultural organizations, all across our civic organizations, we've been intentional about telling our young people who they are. And we wanted to do this in a systematic way at scale um, with the excellence and joy and love that you know black folks bring to the party. And so we developed a bunch of different courses, some academic, some cultural, some skills-based, um, some book clubs, all kinds of things that allow our young people to um, come into a space that belongs to them, that feels safe, that is affirming of them, that is motivating, um, and where they can get their learn on. I love it. I love it. I love it. What are you learning in the process now? Because you have been around for a little bit, um, and there are bugs, there are like, you know, things to learn, uh, and you have been very deliberate about your growth. You have been we, very smart about it. So what have you learned? <laughs> so first of all, it's a little crazy to understand that we started this company last May. Uh, we put our, we wrote curriculum all summer and we put our first kids on the platform in September. And so between September and now we've had about 3000 young people take classes on the platform and our student satisfaction rate is a 4.83 out of five, which is astounding to me, right? Because as you said, it's not, there are no bells and whistles. It's not gamified. It's not super fancy techie or whatever. What it is, is it's three things. It is really good content, and it's a lot of content that kids are not learning in school, but kids wish that they were learning in school or wish that they were seeing themselves in their communities in what they were learning. So there's great content. Um, the sessions are led by a tutor. We call them reconstructors. And our tutors are largely um, college students, recent college graduates. We have some teachers. We have some retirees. Um, but they are bringing energy and commitment and vibrancy to these conversations with these young people. Many of them are teaching for us because this is information that they didn't learn when they were in mm. school. And then the third piece is being in conversations with kids that look like you from all around the country. Um, I have a goddaughter and she tells me that her reconstruction course is her Brown Girls Club, where her mm. friends from all over the country come together and read books. She lives in New Jersey. She's got friends in Chicago. And she's got friends in New Orleans, and she's got friends in LA now. And that wouldn't be possible, right, without this reconstruction experience. So from the content to the tutors to the community, that's the magic that is happening at Reconstruction. And so, um, you know, we're excited. We, you know, we've been slow in our in our development and we haven't been, you know, running around advertising a whole bunch because we wanted to get this right and do this um, at a level of excellence and of quality. I mean, you know how I roll, right? I'm yes. not bringing, <laughs> I'm not bringing junk to the table. So. <laughs> Uh, and you, that's what I meant by you've been very deliberate. I mean, you've had this idea and you've been working on it for a long time, but it wasn't like something you rushed to market with. Yeah. And I love that because that means that we can trust it a little bit, a little bit more. You know? <laughs> let's, let's hope so. I mean, I, yeah. you know, for a really, really long time, wondered what a Saturday Academy for kids might look for black kids might look like. And, you know, 
there were a small group of us who actually started working on this idea of a national black curriculum. What do, mm -hmm. what do we want all of our black kids to know and to have read and to be exposed to before they leave high school? Um, and the pandemic just proved to be an opportunity to mm. kind of stop what I was doing. I was working at Teach for All and uh, I was leading work internationally. So I was flying all over the place and that stopped abruptly, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it seemed like as good a time of any as to try this thing that had been a passion project and an idea for me. And and I can't, I, I, I gotta let your listeners know that you are part of the reason why this thing kicked off. Um, there were a lot oh, of different, well. A lot of different things that helped, but you wrote a blog post and you said, did you hear about the meeting where all of the black people are getting together <laughs> to fix education, the fraternities and the sororities, the NAACP, the government, mm. the everybody. And this meeting is happening and people were up in arms about this, this blog post. Now I am thorough. And so I read the whole thing. And of course, at the end, it says, this meeting is not happening, but it should be happening, it's right? It's just a figment of my imagination. Yes, yes. Yeah. But my phone was ringing off the hook. Oh my God, Kaya, I know you're invited to the meeting. I didn't get invited to the meeting. Can you get me in? And I was like, oh Jesus, can you just read to the bottom? There is no meeting. <laughs> People were so mad about that. They were so mad. They were like, why are you going to fool me like that? Oh my um, gosh. You know, I, what I was getting at in that blog post was that we are not poor and we are not without skills and we are not without smart people. So God has given us all these resources. It's like living in a resource rich nation that can't feed itself. Yeah. I like, couldn't figure out why. We have so many great black educators, scholars, researchers, um, um, you named it, fraternities, sororities, Jack and Jill. Uh, so all these organizations with social connections and power, and budgets and infrastructure, and we can't educate 8 million black children? Like that seems weird. Um, so I wanna ask you this question about the position of reconstruction.us. Uh, and, and what I mean by this is, to how far does it go in terms of, of, is it a supplement to your education? Is it something that maybe uh, micro schools or homeschooling black parents could use collectively together? Is it, can it be a replacement for actual full-time schooling? Like what is the position of reconstruction in the life of a black family? That's a great question. So it is one, two, and could potentially be three. Um, it is absolutely supplemental. We call ourselves proudly supplemental. We are complementing and supplementing what kids are learning in school. Um, school is 180 days and seven and a half hours in most places. And so there's just not enough time to cover everything that you would like to cover. And so we feel like, and we don't want our history and our culture shoved into 43 minutes, you know, in a period a couple times a month or for a semester. We wanted to have the luxury to spend all of the time that we want to on the topics that we think are important. So we made it an out of school time thing. Um, and we call ourselves proudly supplemental. Many folks use us as after school or Saturday or, um, or for their enrichment periods or as an elective. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a lot of, of interest and uptake from homeschoolers um, who can absolutely use this. We don't, we say, we go out of our way to say we're not school because we want kids to have a different experience. But if you know me and you know that I ran DC public schools and you know that I'm about academic achievement, then you know that there is academic rigor in these courses. Um, you know, we looked at the common core reading, writing and math standards because they are high standards and they're pretty universal. Um, and we aligned our I mean, our math courses, if you take a full year of reconstruction, fifth grade math, you have taken, you've covered all of the concepts for a fifth grade math class. Um, our K to two foundational reading, we are teaching straight up hardcore phonics and decoding because these babies need to learn how to read. And if school can't do it, we will. Um, so there are lots of really hardcore academic classes that could be substituted, but part of there are two reasons why I didn't do this as an in-school play or as a replacement sort of play. Number one, I, I fundamentally believe that 
in order to teach black kids well, you gotta love black kids. And everybody who's teaching black kids don't love black kids. Everybody who's teaching black kids don't believe in black kids. And you know, we've seen enough hot mic episodes this year to confirm what we've already known, which is that there are people who stand up in front of our kids all day and say terrible things about our kids all, all night, right? And so I didn't wanna put this curriculum, this responsibility in the hands of people who don't believe in black children. And so we position this outside of school so that we could hire the people who would be teaching, so that we could guarantee that the folks who we put in front of kids are about it. Um, and then the other reason, which is just sort of a, a reason of convenience is 50 different states have 50 different state standards. I could spend all my time running around each state to make sure that my courses are up to this state standard or that state standard. And that's not how I wanna spend my time. I wanna spend my time developing really good curriculum. I believe that parents know what good curriculum looks like. They know when their kids are having different conversations with them at the dinner table. They know when their kids are asking to buy different kinds of books or go on different kinds of experiences. And so we haven't had one parent who said to us, you know, oh, well, what standards are that aligned to or what have you? Um, we've had lots of teachers who are like, I can see where these are actually aligned to the standards and I wanna use this. We've had schools who want to substitute this, but I, I, I don't want the government in this business. This is our community dealing with our children, raising up the next generation of strong children so that we don't have to deal with broken men as Frederick Douglass reminds us. Oh, I can't hear you. Wow. Uh oh. Chris, I can't hear you. I don't know what happened. You know what happened? Oh, I can hear you now. Quintel Pro, that's what happens. We are getting to a part that makes any serious Quintel Pro kicks in. <laughs> Just when I'm about to say something. Uh, um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, no, we don't want any broken men. I love the idea that you have been deliberate and careful about putting this together. I am super interested as a parent who is now staring down summer school and starting to think through um, my deep, deep, deep. Like I have, as a parent, I just have to just be honest and, and kind of uh, open with, with you and with the audience is um, I think about this constantly, but I don't come to answers on some things sometimes. I have the same problems that other parents have sometimes. I go to sleep at, at times within the back of my mind knowing I'm not doing the best that we could possibly be doing for our kids, that there's some things they're missing, that just because of where we live and what's available to us, that it's not optimal. And it's a problem when you think so deeply about these things that you know what's possible, but you know you're not getting it. Like you, you start seeing like, oh my God, a much bigger realm of education is possible, but we're not getting it. So um, so we're looking at reconstruction, you know, for the summer, um, just like, what can we do? Uh, I'll give you a, for instance, um, ask my kids about history class. And, you know, I feel fairly astute. I pay attention to these things or whatnot, but the things that they haven't covered. And I have a, uh, you know, a 10 year old, a 12 year old and a 14 year old, almost 14 year old and they have not covered uh, major portions of history. And my 14 year old said, yeah, we've covered, a lot. We've covered wars, <laughs> is what he said, wars, that's it. I'm like, so in your entire career of history, your uh, uh, history lesson so far has been wars and, and mostly just two wars. Not when I say wars, not a lot of them, not like they've taught them world history or anything like that. Um, so I get the supplemental piece. I am definitely looking to go further than supplement and see if there's something that's almost hybrid like, you know, using something like reconstruction to even go deeper than uh, a few things here and there, but even more of like your primary, we some of this, hopefully y'all get to the, the point one day. What we've learned about remote though, is that uh, more people like it, uh, but it's not especially all Especially our folks. That's right. Yeah, especially that our right. folks. So are you learning that, that like more of us are open to some of these things than we may have thought before? I Absolutely. When we conceived of reconstruction, it was way before the pandemic. And we wondered, we, we said we want to put it on a on a technology platform. We want this to be online so that kids, whether they are in, you know, Western Georgia or West Virginia or the upper west side of New York City, wherever kids are, they could actually access this content. 
And we wondered, will kids get on a Zoom call and have a conversation about, you know, black content that doesn't have anything to do with school, right? And we were worried and voila, like one of the silver linings of the global pandemic is we actually learned that they will and they can and many of them thrive in this environment. What we saw this year was a lot of young people, our, our courses happen in small groups. So you're generally in a group with anywhere from four to 10 young people. And at the very beginning, they were really smaller, two and three groups, mm -hmm. groups of two and three kids on with a tutor. And what our kids said is like, on my, in class, I'm one of 25 on the screen, but in at reconstruction, it's just me and my people, right? Me and my mm -hmm. friends, it's three of us or four of us. And so there's no hiding, there's no ducking, there's no, you know, camera off. You're actually engaged. And our kids say they feel seen. Our kids say they, you know, enjoy the the interchange, the exchange. And and so we've learned that absolutely. And I think, you know, at a time, then we were worried, okay, well, now kids are zoomed out, right? They hate Zoom. They hate, you know, they're on the, the technology all day long. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that kids who hate school Zoom love reconstruction. They are busting down doors to get to their reconstruction class on time and to be engaged. And so we're learning a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, here's what we know, right? When kids, when kids see themselves in curriculum, when kids feel affirmed, when kids are doing stuff, that's fun, right? Like we're not giving you math for math's sake. We're giving you problems to solve in the black community. Oh, and math is the tool that you need to do that, right? When we engage kids this way, when we treat them, when we give them things that are worthy of their time and attention, when we empower them to lead and make decisions, right? Kids are super into it. We mm -hmm. underestimate our kids all the time. And that's not what we do at Reconstruction. And kids respect that and respond to that. It sounds to me like a big piece of this is the social interaction too. I hadn't really thought that much about it. I've been thinking about like your your take on what will be your take on pedagogy and curriculum and that stuff. But this social piece too, I mean, it almost feels like, you know, the online version of an HBCU for young it's, people. It's who we, like we are, this is the thing about culturally responsive pedagogy. You take the things that are positive about a culture and you embed them in the way you teach. We are a communal mm -hmm. people. Right. Mm -hmm. We like to get mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. We like to chit chat. We like to talk. Mm -hmm. We like to dance. We are like we That's are what artists. It's cookout. It's That's called right. the cookout. <laughs> <laughs> we like to dance. We like yeah. to create. We like we've got a spoken word class, right? Where kids are learning great black speeches, black poems, black, you know, rap lyrics, whatever, because we have an oratorical tradition in our culture. Why mm. suppress that? We're telling these kids, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. That's how other cultures are, right? We are expressive and emotional and oratorical. So let's bring that into the classroom. Mm. What do you think? I love this as a, you know, as a, as a learning, I definitely think it's smart to step outside of somebody else's frame and create your own frame. But if we had to step back into other people's frame, what do you hope that the mainline schools, I mean, you've been in on both sides of this, on all sides of this, would start to learn to do better over time? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know how to ask the question, Kai, because it's almost like, why haven't we learned this stuff already? So, I mean, let's go back to a paper that you and I sort of wrote together as we were ideating about this. And we thought to ourselves, okay, we need to create our own thing first. We need to then institutionalize whatever this thing is within our HBCUs so that they become the centers of educational learning, reclaiming this, this mm -hmm. educational mm -hmm. capital that we lost, you know, after Brown. And then let's teach the system how mm -hmm. to teach our children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very important that that was step three for us. Cause like, I don't care to spend my time knocking my head against a wall that is not gonna fall down for me. I would much rather spend my time impacting the kids that I can impact with the influence that I have, right? So impacting the system is a secondary or a tertiary you know, ideal for me. I hope that they'll look over at us and be like, oh my God, what's going on over there? What are they doing? Why are those kids 
accelerating. Because my 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 secret plan, frankly, is to give you know second graders in reconstruction fourth grade curriculum, right? Mm-hmm. My my secret plan is to produce a set of kids who are so accelerated. If they want their kids to read by third grade, I want our kids to read by first grade, right? Like I want to create a a group of a a, a of black super children. Wow. Wow. The world is not ready for. I want people to wake up and be like, where did these kids come from? How did they do this? And, and then I want the system to come and say, what's happening over here? Teach us how to do it. But still I'm wary because again, so much of this requires a belief in the capacity of these young people to do amazing things. Mm-hmm. I know they can, cause you know, I, I say all the time, people will say, oh my gosh, you're a unicorn. I'm not a unicorn. I, or if I am a unicorn, I come from a herd of unicorns. There are a whole bunches <laughs> of us out here. You just don't know where to find us. You just don't know how to recognize us, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I wanna unleash Well, Kaya, I don't know if you're DC or Marvel, but I mean, everybody, all the world knows um, Wonder Woman. But uh, when you go back to the island that she's from and you see that there's a whole bunch of Wonder Women yes. uh, there yes. or whatnot, it's kind of eye opening. But yes. that's where we are right now. You're the Wonder Woman. <laughs> mm. <laughs> You're the Wonder Woman in a lot of ways, <laughs> because number one, first of all, when I said earlier that we have a lot of black talent, we have a lot of resources and skills that we're not tapping into right now. Black women are, are one of those resources that are the, the the remaining part of our educational black capital that I said was lost. The little bit that we have left is all tied up in black women. Yeah. It is all tied up in black women educators, uh, which brings me to my brother, Sharif el Mecca. He's trying to get more <laughs> brothers into the, into the system. He's trying to get more black males into teaching. Uh, um, the, Sharif, what's the statistic? What's the uh, statistic, brother? One point seven, and let me just clarify: we're trying to bring both. Cause we still need more dope sisters, more super women, more. You we know, do, her, but but, but, 1. Yeah, 7? but black men, one point seven percent, bro. One point seven percent. One point seven percent. A couple years ago, it was one point nine percent. So we're actually going backwards. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember. I remember the two percent number because when we when I was leading DC public schools, we were lucky enough to have nineteen percent wow. black men teaching. Mm-hmm. Right. And that happens in so you know crazy. some some chocolate cities like DC and maybe Atlanta or whatever. But we need to change that across the board. Absolutely. That literally means that there's probably more black males at Weezer concerts than there are in public schools. <laughs> I don't know who Weezer is. <laughs> but See, I'm that. That. That's my point. That's my point. That's my point. <laughs> I, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah I mean, that the, is my point. You're, you know, when children, when we talk to youth and they talk about uh, seeing black men, it's usually in um, a different type of role, you know, um, maybe a custodian, you know, and definitely the police, you know, like how, you know, and I think often that's how we're recruited. You know, we're labeled in a certain way, even from the interview. Um, I've spoken to so many black men who said, like, I actually interviewed with in for this school. But central office moved me over here and then later fa- found out and it was a match. Right. The school wanted wanted this black man. You know, he wanted to be yeah. there and they switched him and said, like, oh, yeah, we need more kind of authority. You know, that that presence. So we're going to just move you over here. So very early on, pigeonhole labeled in pigeonhole to yeah. serve in a very particular way. I think it's a reason we started the fellowship uh, with 17 black men from all over the country. And we were all in Philadelphia doing the work and successful relatively good looking the works right like and so but what happened not a single one of us had been approached to teach until after we graduated college there's a reason for that when we asked our colleagues most of them were white women they said third grade was when someone tapped them on the shoulder and said consider teaching for us it was after we graduated and i think it was because like oh black man come in here and and, and get control of these black kids right mm-hmm. instead of mm-hmm. in the beginning and saying hey you know what? We trust you to engage and teach and educate. We weren't approached in that way, and from a lot of uh, you know, a lot of experiences. Yeah, it almost seems systemic. I just wish there was a way to study systemic racism. It just seems like there should be a way to to study it that I don't know about. Anyways, um, welcome, brother. Thank you for uh, joining Freedom Friday, and we are still not free, but we're getting there. We're getting there with this content and thinking about these things. Did you hear Kaya say that she is trying to build black super children? I loved it. I loved it. Are you kidding me? 
I loved it. She was like super <laughs> children where people say like, yo, super what's children. happening over there? Like yes. what is, what's going on? Right. Yes. Like, and that's, that's exactly. And you know what, when you get out of our way, you can ask that question a whole lot more. Right. Yeah. And I think this is uh, but this is also um, what I love about it is just this, you know, we always, it always comes back to Kuji Chakalia, self-determination, right? Like this sister is like, you know what? Nah, we're going to do this. I remember we were, uh, was it New York in New York and, and, you know, at the table having dinner and y'all were like, you know what? Nah, we about to unleash something, you know, like, because this is we, where people don't know this. That's where this comes from. Problem child. And, uh, <laughs> it, and y'all can get the problem child shirt at uh citizen <laughs> All right. You know, because if we are doing our job, a system this jacked up, we should be raising problem children. We oh. should be raising children that are a problem for this system. Because if the system is this jacked up, they don't deserve uh, obedient uh, children to go along with what they're being taught. Um, we did. We need to raise disruptors. But I love Kaya's way better of putting it: black super children. I mean, but uh, we so. we have to teach our children to be problem children, right? Yes. Because the yes. the schools are teaching them to be docile and to be calm and to not challenge authority and whatnot. We're in conversations with a professor at Morehouse, um, this amazing brother, Dr. Ilya Davis. And we're in conversations about him designing a critical thinking course that teaches you to challenge everything that you've learned mm -hmm. and redefines what a fact is. And I mean, we were on the phone with this brother last week and we were like, yes, if our kids are asking these kinds of questions, like then I feel confident that we're raising problem children, right? Mm. Um, good troublemakers. And so Get that's what we want to do, right? Like that's that. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to we might have to incorporate that into the title of the course. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I mean the school should be safe places for you to do that, but it's probably, you know, for black children one of the most dangerous places to do. That's right. Right. Yeah, you know, like yeah. to no, I to challenge. Like that takes practice. And you should have a safe space to do that, to critically think, to make mistakes, to challenge authority. Like, you know, because at the end of the day, we're always like, oh yeah, we want them to be leaders. What does a leader do but challenge? The status quo, you know, and right. so, but when, yes. when, when do we afford them the, the time and space and safety to practice that? You know, I should, um, I should jump in here. We have a few people making, uh, comments, uh, a lot of people making comments. Chioma, uh, actually chose violence this morning because she says there's only one chocolate city. Um, so, <laughs> so, so Chioma, thank you, Chioma, Dr. Chioma, uh, for choosing violence in the morning. Um, um, uh, as a native of New Orleans, you, you know, whatever. Okay. But do y'all got a latte city? Huh? Huh? Y'all got a latte city? Whatever. Um, um, there was a question also from Chioma because Chioma does, she's in DC. Chioma does a lot of thinking and work around children with disabilities. Uh, was wondering if you had any thoughts, Kaya, about how the supplemental education movement, uh, out of school time movement, whatever we want to call it for black education, um, really takes on some of the uh, the issues that are being dropped by schools in special education. Yeah, I think um, it, what what I would say is it's I would love to talk to Chioma about how we do that well. Um, we're in some conversations with some people around how we modify some of the lessons that we are that we've created to make sure that a range of kids with special needs can actually access the courses. So Chioma, if you're looking for a job or you got some consulting time on your hands, hit a sister up because we want to be able to reach all of our young people. Uh, we're not doing it well. I mean, we haven't, we just haven't started there. Um, but I think that part of the challenge is in, I don't even want to say that, right? I was going to say part of the challenge is in finding people who can help us do that, but that's BS because I hear, you know, these publishing houses and whatnot say, I can't find black curriculum developers. And like I went out and found black curriculum developers. And so we just have not been as intentional. I'm going to make a commitment and say out loud, Chioma, if you help me, we're going to figure out a stable of people who can help us make sure that we're creating content for kids with special needs. I will definitely connect y'all because Chioma is the truth. All she right. Is, she is the truth.com um, <laughs> with a backslash and everything else. Right. So I will connect y'all. Um, there was also a question I thought I saw in here somewhere. It was around a little bit around the C CRT stuff. And, uh, and Sharif and I both wrote this week about this growing movement <laughs> against 
um, CRT. Where this is landing that I think is dangerous is actually passing bills yep. that forbid the teaching of critical race theory. Um, do you, is this a yet another uh, reason, Kaya, where we might want to drive towards out of the system schooling things Absolutely. that we can think about out of the system? Absolutely. Like I, I cannot, I can't, I can't hold up black children's education to the whims of the state legislature, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, we got kids who are sitting in front of us right now. When I led DC public schools, I felt like my hair was on fire every single day because those kids didn't get another first grade year or another eighth grade year or whatever. So let the people do what they're gonna do. Are we surprised about this? We mm -hmm. shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> History shows us that. So this is one of the reasons why we we call the company reconstruction is hearkening back, Chris, to the 12 years, just 12 years after emancipation, where we got ourselves a little free. Right. They didn't want to be bothered with us, but we were like, OK, we'll incorporate our own towns. We will own our own farmland. We will create 37 historically black colleges and universities. Again, the people who don't care about education, 37 colleges and universities in 12 years, 5,000 community schools in 12 years, 300,000 black people voted, voted in an election that was decided with only 500,000 votes, right? So all of this, you know, Voting is irrelevant, blah, blah, blah. We elected our first black congressmen, senators, right? Let whole state legislature, South Carolina, right? Were predominantly black. When they let us free, mm -hmm. we did our thing. We were crushing it. And 12 years, remember, we're the lazy ones. We're the ones who didn't know anything. We're the ones who whatever. 12 years, boom. And they were like, you know what? This too much, <laughs> shut it down. Mm -hmm. And so the Ku Klux Klan and so Jim Crow, system legislation to mm -hmm. stop us from doing our thing. This is as old as the hills. So whatever. Like, and what do we do? We do what we do anyway. So let's just do it. We survive each time after uh, emancipation, they tried to shut it down. After reconstruction, they tried to shut it down. After civil rights or desegregation, they tried to shut it down. And civil rights, they tried to shut it down. And affirmative action, they tried to shut it down. No matter, it's it's the Maya Angelou theory though, no matter, and still I rise, like out yeah. of all these things. So you better start recognizing the power of black people in um, being the most hopeful story that you can possibly have because there has been no group of people in the United States or in the world, honestly, the wretched of the earth who, who continue to rise through the cracks that you, yeah. you you try to pave over our success and we bust up through the cracks and it, it, there there's a rose in the concrete everywhere yes. you go in all this entire world. Resilience is our birthright. Like That's right. The, the resilience is our birthright. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and Sharif, you wrote about this this week. So you chose Ooh, violence this week. Sharif, chose... <laughs> Sharif was Listen. not violent. He was not violent. <laughs> Listen, I, I think, you know, you know what? You talk about like Barbara in DC, that one scene where he like, I'm always angry. Like, I'm always mad. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's, you know, I feel like I've been able to just contain it and I channel it through my work, right? Like, you know, I was able to get outcomes with a team of folks because we had this collective and this combination, symbiotic nature of uh, rage and love, right? Love for our right. community and outrage for the conditions that are forced upon them, right? Like you talk about these 12 year, like these are the folks who were like, oh, we can't uh, have this emancipation. They're lazy and shiftless. What will they do? And then Kaya just, you know, shares, right? Like here's <laughs> this, all the things that they will do, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. like, and so when, yeah. you know, when Frederick Douglass talks about, you know, you're unfit to be enslaved when you have the knowledge, when you're able to be literate, you know, when you're able to read like those things, like we have to take that and use that black blueprint from before and continue to use it today. And, and I think mm -hmm. this is the beauty of reconstruction. And I think sometimes you got to ignore stuff, know when to choose. And then sometimes you got to check some chins. Right. Like that's just how how it is. Like, yeah, I ain't, ain't responding. I'm not responding. I'm not responding. Bam. Like you gotta, you know, you, you mm -hmm. just have to know when, um, you know, my martial arts teachers always say like, you know, a well-placed jab is the best wake up call, you know? So <laughs> sometimes we gotta jab a couple folks, you know? I, you know? I thought, I actually thought the combination of your two pieces was really important. One, to, I'll say to both of you, 
thank you for modeling civil conversation um, because I think so many of our adults don't actually know how to disagree respectfully. Um, and, and, and you win when, when you disagree respectfully. And I think both of you did that um, at the same time, pulling no punches. And what I loved Chris about your piece was, and this, I was a little, actually, I, I was expecting maybe the opposite, but what I loved about your piece, Chris, was it appealed to parents, in any parent, in a way that, like, I want what's best for my kids. Mm -hmm. I am out here willing to fight for it, willing to die for it. Every parent can identify with that. Mm -hmm. And so you made us no different than any other parent out there. And, you know, people want to act like we're crazy and act like, oh, no, we are doing what every other parent is doing. Mm -hmm. And we want people who are willing to be in that fight with us. It was a much more universal message than I usually expect from you. <laughs> see, see how this goes? That's when you're a problem child. When people and don't then, expect you to do <laughs> And then Sharif came with the one, two. It wasn't just the jab. It was a one, no. two punch. It was it, it was, was a, a one kick. two three. It was a combination. <laughs> it was it was a whole set of things. Yeah. There was deep, deep. I mean, first of all, just don't even read Sharif's thing. Just click on the links and get the research, get the history, get the. It was so chock full of like I have read this piece four or five. Times. I, I will say I read the piece and I was like. I can't even touch my phone to retweet this. This joker is so hot. But like the research, the the citations, the backup for the argument are in, intellectually impeccable, right? And that is gorgeous. We we have a tradition of black intellectualism that Sharif just pulled down and served up. And then he was like, and what you're not gonna do is tell me that you are positive and doing good things for our kids when you don't even see your blinders. You don't even see. So I'm, let me point those out for you in a constructive and, and positive way. And at the end of the day for me, Sharif's piece, like rage and love, that was it. I wrote on my Facebook page or something that like, this is this Sharif's, you know, Sharif's piece invites us to a very tough conversation. It invites us to challenge in ways that many of us, not just white people, let's get real with this. There's black people who are reading this and are feeling the prick in their heart because they're not doing right by our kids either. And so this is an opportunity for all of us. I'm using this in my whole organization. We're gonna use this for selection. What do you what do you think? What do you believe about teaching black kids? And what I wrote on my Facebook page is it's tough, it's hard, like this is going to make us all feel uncomfortable, but this is built on a foundation of love for black children and for black people. And that comes through in both of your pieces in a, an incredibly powerful way. And for all the people who think that, you know, we're angry and we're violent and we're all of that, but it comes from a place of <laughs> deep, we are, we are, it's okay. But, look, but, but we, but it is because we love our, children and we love ourselves and we love our our families and we're trying to rebuild the black community yeah, yeah and you know ray ankrum uh is gonna get after me because the three of us actually took this we took this from three different positions mm -hmm. uh on this piece ray did a piece that was more i think uh principle centric centric around principle you know a take on it uh, I did more of a parent uh, take on it, and Sharif did. <laughs> Sharif chose straight up violence because 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 Ray put out a piece first out of all of us, and it was like boom, 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 boom. It was very uh, efficient. <clears throat> I put out mine, and mine was like boom, 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 boom. Sharif, this joker writes a four thousand uh, word response with with all kinds of links. Uh, yeah, this is the else. shorter version. So, Chris, what? Like, if you, yes, <laughs> yes, Chris this is the like, short you know, version. Throw that, you know, that's too yeah. long, bro. Like, Can I'll, you send me the long version, please? The long version was five I'm about pieces. To, so. I'm about to laminate this joker and just read it from time <laughs> to time when things get rough. Listen, shout out to uh, you know Chris and and his team for for posting because some folks were like, "Nah, we ain't posting that." You know what I mean? So, you know, some I, of the I folks who that. should have posted it, some of the folks who should be heeding the message and who were high on publicizing the other person's post uh, who started this discussion had feedback that was uh, that was. How can we still control the debate as white people? So let me 
chop up your piece in a way that favors us. And it was like, we're not having that. But one thing I do want to, since I have both of you here, you make the point, Sharif, in this piece that colorblindness is not actually what we're attempting to achieve. Um, and what I saw a lot of response was, which is surprise, not it shouldn't be surprising. It is surprising to me. So many people saying, I've thought my whole life that that was the, the goal. I've been that's taught it. my whole life that's the goal. What do you mean? What are you trying to say here? And I love when you look at reconstruction.us, it is like the opposite of color blindness. It is no basically saying we are going to be unapologetically uh, about the black piece. Both of you have had political in engagement in the public and had to deal with large numbers of, of educators. What's this thing about like people not getting that color blindness is not the goal? Yeah. Go ahead. I'll let, you I'll let the author start us off. Okay, all right. I mean, I, I think a, a big part of that is, you know, um, when you have guilt, you know, and, and I think white guilt sometimes can be uh, really powerful. Right. And so instead of saying like, hey, I'm going to channel this and use it constructively, like, yes, my answer, like we have white people who've researched their families and say, oh, yeah, you know what? Like, actually, my family. Oh, oh, this is where I got some of my wealth or this is where I got the land. Right. That uh, scene where uh, uh, former secretary John King uh, goes and visits the, the land where he was enslaved and the family, the descendants of the enslavers still live there. And the first, the, what they greeted him with is what you hear for money, <laughs> what you want, you want, you want money from us. Is that why you're here? He's like, nah, I'm, I'm just showing my family. I'm, I'm exploring my own uh, history. I, you know, like, I just want to see where, where we were. And, you know, they couldn't wrap their brains around that. You know, that initial was, you know, <laughs> What, what do you want from us? And so I, I think some of that is is deeply tied in. And then other times folks want to, uh, you know, that is what whiteness does. Whiteness erases and makes whiteness the default. Because when you're saying colorblind, we could just, you know, I think language is important. You can say just whiteness because that's what colorblindness means. It means erasure of anyone else that does not abide by my standards of everything, whether it's beauty, culture, you know, pedagogy, whatever it is, it should only be this way. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I, I think that, I mean, I think colorblindness is laziness. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it is the automatic default to the status quo. If you are not colorblind, it means that you have to learn about other people, other people's history, other people's mm -hmm. culture, right? Mm -hmm. It means you have to be intellectually curious and it means that you have to concentrate on, uh, you have to develop empathy. It means that you have to build relationships, right? But if you don't have to do that because the world revolves around you and everybody else, you, I mean, colorblind means I don't have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that other people do things differently in different ways and and what have you. And so I think I think it is a it is a lazy attempt to take people off the hook for doing the hard work of of learning about other people. And the reason why it's important for us to build strong black children is, you know, we we're, we have to live reconstruction was a period where black people and white people had to renegotiate how they live together right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The power dynamic was different. We think right now we have to renegotiate how we interact with all kinds of people that we live with. We want to shift the power dynamic. And the way you do that is being strong in yourself first. That way, when you come into contact with other people who are also strong in their history, their culture, their whatever, you can have the intellectual, you know, tete a tete. You can engage in intellectual debate because you know who you are and you know where you come from. You're standing on solid ground. But what we've done with colorblindness is, you know, elevate one, depreciate the other. And then this is how they interact with one another. And, oh, we are bringing our kids to the point that they know enough about themselves that they can come to the conversation prepared. Yeah, it feels like, um there's a disconnect in two directions. Like there is the one group of white people who really feel like colorblindness is the goal because it's the least, it, it's comfortable. It's the least kind of like, you know, if, if they're gonna be kind of civil rights people, it's the most comfortable they can be is to say, let's just have no color matter. But for other people, I think there is this earnest thing of like, you know, I was a child of the 60s and I was told, I was taught by my parents that, you know, seeing color is a bad thing and they stopped there. 
that's the end of their their growth on the issue and arrested think, development that's, that's arrested that's development what, right and and honestly to be very honest with you i think that's the best word two words because we're dealing with the arrested development and outbreak of it nationally where people are having to wake up and be like i can't believe i didn't have it exactly right I mean, you've got this this viral video of a white woman at a school board meeting saying, just because I don't want my kids taught um, critical race theory does not make me a racist, damn it. And she's crying. And like the response was like, that's literally the definition of a racist. <laughs> that, that's like that's like literally the definition of something that is racist ish. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe it's I not mean, racist all the way, but it's racist ish. But it's such a lie too, right? This idea of color, because if they were colorblind, we wouldn't see the patterns that we see. Like that you can right. predict, oh, you can on. predict what color is going to yeah. catch what hell because you're lying about being colorblind. You want, yeah. you want to tell us that, but all your laws, your policy, all of that is that's baked in and it just gets doubled down on shows that you're not, you're actually anti-black. <laughs> you, you want to have this false veneer to say, no, we're colorblind. This is just how the chips fell. No, the hell it ain't. Like, this is exactly how it was engineered. That's not where the chips fell. It's where the chips were engineered. So it's a level of arrogance, laziness. It's like a combination of psychotic behavior, bro. And this is where it's going to be, like, even more important, I think. Um, if the system is going to keep doing that and being that way, supplemental learning, learning that we take into our own hands outside of those systems is going to be our only strategy right now because we're not going to change the system any day soon. They're not going to wake up next Tuesday and be suddenly super culturally competent. As a matter of fact, the need for parents as such as myself, and I'm talking to parents directly, not educators, because educators got their own politics and organizations and theories going on. They got all their stuff going on. And let let smart people argue with smart people. But smart people are going to do what smart people are going to do, which is show up to hotel conferences and talk oh. about us without us and trade a bunch of papers that nobody's reading with a bunch of Greek letters in them. And, and we're not going to make any progress if we just keep letting that be the norm. I love me some educators who actually see educator as a verb, meaning that if no one is in your in your stay as being educated you're not an educator right uh -huh. and um some people will say to me chris have you ever taught and i will pull up their school and their and their outcomes and i will say obviously you haven't either so 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 obviously we have something in common neither one of us have taught but when i talk to parents this is what i'm saying it's in your hands you've got to find supplemental education alternative education out of school time might be your primary time to make sure you don't raise culturally backwards retrograde children that might be your only uh, chance to do it. Um, I know we're coming up on an hour. I wanted to ask, I had a question for you, Kaya, just about, um, I follow you on Instagram and on the socials. I'd be living vicariously. You'd be on beaches, <laughs> eating like shrimps and stuff, shrimps with different flavors and uh, crack open lobsters and just all kinds of, there's sunshine. It's sunshine. Work and, hard, and, play hard, and, and, work yeah, hard, play hard. Um, but, but my question is not to hate on the fact that your Instagram is, is like Beyonce's. Uh, um, but it's, it's more to say, how much of this stuff that we talk about locally here in the United States that feels like a domestic situation is more global or there's like similar problems going on elsewhere? Similar problems all over the place, right? All over the place. Somebody's in power and somebody's catching hell. And the education system just like here reinforces those power dynamics um and everybody is trying to get free around the world and i spent my time i spent two years visiting communities literally all over the world and helping communities come together to say you get to decide what you want education to look like and here's how you need to work differently with the system in order to demand and and receive what you want the way we did our work in DC public schools, you know, maybe because I hadn't, you know, come up through the ranks of traditional education. I was a very um, untraditional superintendent. I didn't follow the path. Um, I, I also that meant that I didn't rely on my own expertise to figure out what the solutions were. I fundamentally believe that these schools were not my schools. These schools were our schools, right? So we, as a community, were going to make decisions about how we transformed our school district. And that's what, that's how I was spending my time running around the world, helping to, communities to understand these are your schools. 
So you get to say what you want to see. You get to say you don't want drill and kill. You want art and music and PE and foreign language. You get to say you want to see your indigenous language or your indigenous culture reflected in what your children are learning. You get to say, don't just you know, prepare my kids for jobs, prepare my kids for careers, or prepare my kids to stay in their towns and transform them, not leave and go to the city. We get to decide that. And the problem, part of the problem that we have right now is we've forgotten that we have power. I had power when I was the, the, the superintendent of DC public schools, but I have even more power as the CEO of Reconstruction, because I get to decide what our kids learn. I get to give them courses in spoken word, in cooking, in in academics, in whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and that's what Freedom Friday is all about. We get to decide what our kids learn, and we don't just need to rely on government schools. And I, I say that having run government schools. Mm. See, Kaya, Kaya choosing violence in the morning. Everybody just like, I'm not choosing violence. <laughs> I, am choosing, I am choosing a path yeah. of least yeah. resistance to freedom for my children. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Sharif, mm -hmm. as we wrap, any, any final questions for our illustrious guests? Listen, um, not necessarily a question, but I want to just shout out. Listen, my daughters have taken the courses uh, multiple times. Um, and, and they love it. You know, uh, one's five, the other one's seven. And it's it's one of the things they get to do together, um, and they they absolutely love it. You know um, the content, the creativity, um, and it just reminds me of like what Black folks used to do. You know, and so I'm, 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 I love the I love the title, uh, and I shouldn't say used to do because Black folks are doing this in communities and things like that yes, all the time. Um, so I, I, I definitely misspoke there, but I love how it's organized in a way where it's a concerted effort. Um, to do this. And, you know, we've spoken before about owning out of school time as like a first big step to then, you know, and simultaneously building more of our schools, right? So if we can do this out of school time, that means, hey, you know what, you could do this as a full time uh, yeah. thing, right? And continuing um, that effort. So it's not just a, a detox center, it is now more of a affirming and empowering um, uh, center. Yeah. And I think that can really help because I think a lot of times we're in reaction like, oh, how do I detox and and support this child to, you know, unbrainwash them for that? Where this is more like, no, this is going to affirm you. It's going to educate you and it's going to embolden you so that you can be that problem child uh, for the future. So I just want to say thank you, mm -hmm. Queen Kaya, for <laughs> continuing to, uh, you know, to lead leaders lead. Right. Like and no matter what settings they are. Right. Like you know, some folks who are superintendents, they retire and. You're like, well, they weren't really leading then and they're not leading now. And some leave there and they start leading on, on bigger and grander scales. Um, and I 100 percent agree. Like sometimes the flexibility, the freedom to fully implement your vision is actually outside of the constraints of, of various systems. Yeah. I mean, we did we did amazing work in D.C. public schools. Right. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I got there in 2007, it was the lowest performing urban school district in the country, according to the NAEP. When I left, it was the fastest improving. I've been gone almost five years and it's still the fastest improving, despite lots of leadership changes and whatnot. We did deep, deep academic and extracurricular work that is still paying off for kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to do more of that and I need to do it on my terms. And that is why I'm doing what I'm doing at Reconstruction. And I just want to remind folks, um, you can find Reconstruction. It's uh, reconstruction.us. This is it. Unapologetically Black education, personal world-class education at home for $10 per session. Absolutely. So I don't want none of y'all people talking to me about, oh my God, you know, I can't afford this and that and the other. <laughs> it's, you think, it's, at a, you know, it's at a great price point. Right. And whoever said it, I don't know who said it first, but if you think that the price of education is high, you should try ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, and we don't want that. We don't want you to try ignorance. We want you to try a little bit of violence and a lot of bit of education. So 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 choose love, uh, love for your people or whatnot. Please go check this out. Reconstruction.us. This is the platform that Kaya is the founder and CEO of um, uh, Get Nothing Co Great. Co-founder. Shout out to my co-founder, Roland Fryer, who has been in this with me from day one. And yeah, we're doing it. 
and the amazing team. Everybody should go and, and, we and have look an at awesome what, team. yes, an awesome team. Uh, one of my faves, wait, uh, Tanya Brad Bradshaw yeah, Bradshaw's there now. <laughs> Tanya Bradshaw's there now. So okay, um, wait. Is, let me yeah. say just one thing. My yeah. team would kill me. So we're doing yeah. a Juneteenth celebration where. Oh, wow. The Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of Juneteenth, we're having a family barbecue, virtual family barbecue. We are doing um, free reconstruction classes so you can come on and get a taste of reconstruction for free that weekend. We're doing things with key partners like Step Africa. There'll be a huge step show that you can get for free. We're doing reconstruction fam jam, which is our dance party that we did over New Year's. It'll be a weekend's full of activities that you just sign up. You can get a virtual toolkit and participate in a whole bunch of stuff with us. Mm. Come hang out with us on Emancipation Day, um, yeah. our Emancipation Day, Juneteenth, that whole weekend. Um, and yeah, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You'll see a bunch of links and posts about that coming in the next week. Is the so, um, is the is this information about the Juneteenth stuff, is this on the site now or it'll be coming? It, it'll be site? up in the next week. Which is, okay. All right. Well, people be watching. Pay attention. Uh, I'm also getting violence from my other eight black hands here. Uh, Charles and Ray. Uh, hey, Cole. Are, yeah, they're watching. Dr. Cole is, when are we going to get the invite to Pod Save uh, uh, America? So pod anyways, save the people. Says, say it's Pod Save the People. So what y'all uh, want to do? Let me go so. talk to my, let me go talk to my boss at Pod Save the People and see what we could do. Talk to the team. Bring in, you know, bring, bring the world class wrecking crew to uh, <laughs> of education. We are the world class wrecking crew of education. Uh, bring us there. Um, listen, it has been another Freedom Friday, and we are still not free, but hopefully you're freer at the end of this hour than you were at the beginning. We think that we have given you some key steps to your freedom. Consider the uh, supplemental education, the out-of-school time of your children as a very powerful time that you could use to make sure that you're raising uh, culturally prepared problem children who create a problem for the system. And I don't mean the problem the way that we problem problematize our kids. I mean a problem in the way that we have a system that uh, values obedience and values kind of ignorance in too many ways, but we wanna send them what Kaya said, black super children who ask all the right questions, think about the system cr uh, critically, and change the system, become the leaders that we need to free us in the future. So thank you again for watching. We appreciate any time that you give to the education of our children.